Good afternoon and welcome to the 25th episode of Genomics Cupship. Uh, Genomics Cupship was designed to make genomics more accessible to the average consumer, um, patient, human, anybody who's interested to know more. And we've been uh, able to get a lot of experts in the field of genomics who can actually explain and simplify you know, difficult concepts uh, into easy way uh, to be able to explain what science is all about. And today being the 25th and the silver um, silver anniversary of our genomics gupshap, I guess I don't know if you can call it anniversary, but 25th episode, uh, we are very delighted to have a very, very prolific um, a scientist who, whose research interests are very varied. Uh, please welcome Dr. Thangaraj. Uh, he is uh, director at CDFT, but he's also uh, continues to do a lot of science at CCNB. So, and if you look through his research uh, profile on Google or something, is he has a very high H index, which means he's extremely high, and writes uh, very, very high impact uh, papers, a lot of that are read by many people across the world. So welcome to the show, Dr. Thangaraj. We are extremely delighted to have you. It is, uh, it is absolutely an honor and pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anu, and it's my pleasure to be part of this event and uh, particularly, as you said, it's a 25th uh, uh, event which you are hosting. Thank you very much for calling uh, for this particular event. Thank you. So, so Dr. Thangaraj, you've been, uh, you know, you've got into this whole human genetic space many years before others did. Uh, what inspired you to uh, get, uh, do a PhD in this space and, and obviously continue your research? Can you, can you tell us, you know, how you got inspired by genetics? Uh, genetics actually is everywhere, right? So although um, we term this as a scientific uh, uh, terminology, but if you go to a village, people understand what is genetics because they select the seed, the mm -hmm. best seed, which they, they understand uh, genetics, not the way we understood, but they know that uh, you need to have some very good uh, seed are uh, very good um, uh, uh, kind of plant, a very good uh, animal. Uh, so all these they understand. Uh, so I basically come from a farming family. So I, I, I like genetics. So I took genetics as my favorite subject. So, so that's the idea. So. so it was more at that point from a plant's perspective or... or or uh, human or or just that you saw that in in terms of the you know in the farming community you saw how you select or, or breed i guess in like you mentioned finding yeah, out the right species yeah that's true at this point of time i like that idea but uh, slowly then i also came to know that because india has a large number of genetic diseases uh, so then i i, I choose to do phd in human genetics mm -hmm. And uh, but in human genetics is quite vast, right? So when you look at genetics, uh, there are many many things that you can do. Uh, how did you end up choosing the subjects or or the subjects for research in your case? Because I think you were, you have been one of the few who work very extensively on um, Indian ancestry, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. You also worked on many complex diseases and and many other uh, areas, but. How did your journey as a scientist go and when did you start on, let's say, ancestry, for instance, and what triggered that uh, that excitement in this field? Yeah, in fact, uh, during my MPhil dissertation, I worked on population genetics. Of course, uh, it's on biochemical genetics, particularly serum protein polymorphism. So uh, then during my PhD, I worked on cytogenetics. Uh, then I joined CCMB um, long ago, nearly 30 years ago, uh, with Dr. Lalji Singh. Uh, in fact, um, Professor Ed Southern. Mm. The who, Southern Blood. Oh, Southern Blood. So one of his colleagues, uh, Dr. Chris Silas Smith from Oxford University, who works very extensively on Y chromosome polymorphism, try to understand human population history. So they wanted to collaborate with us and Dr. Lalji Singh uh, thought because being a, a human geneticist, so he discussed with me as, uh, and want us whether uh, to collaborate with them in this field. So that's a starting point. 
for us to uh, go into the field of uh, human genetic, particularly human tracing the human ancestry. Uh, and also I work on various fields, all are interconnected. Okay. Uh, if you take my field, I work on uh, tracing the ancestry, uh, try to understand uh, how different ethnic groups are connected. Uh, then if you come to the disease aspect, I work on uh, mitochondrial disorders. I work on uh, male infertility. Uh, so these three, tracing ancestry, for tracing ancestry, we use mitochondrial DNA to trace maternal ancestry, Y chromosome DNA to trace paternal ancestry. So now the mitochondrial disease is very well connected because we sequence the mitochondrial genome. So that's the way we enter into the mitochondrial disease aspect. Similarly, a large number of infertile males will have Y chromosome microdeletions. Mm -hmm. So being working on the Y chromosome polymorphism, we try to uh, look at the Y chromosome microdeletion to understand the genetic aspects of male infertility. Of course, that is taken into different aspects now, looking at uh, various uh, chromosomes, including autosomes. So that's the starting point. So to diverge from from ancestry to uh, understanding the disease aspects of uh, both mitochondrial disorders and the infertility. So for, for a lot of people, I think, you know, when, when they think about ancestry, they feel that is a fun, uh, you know, a fun sort of a test to do because they understand where they come from. But in reality, and like you explained, I think there is a lot of connection between when you do research on ancestry, but also how diseases evolve over a period of time, right? Um, but, you know, I think from, from a consumer standpoint, I think it is good because, you know, that's a fundamental question you ask that, you know, where did I come from? Who am I? Right. But, um, you know, from, uh, from your point of view, so you said you started with the human genetics, the population genetics, and then slowly evolved into, into the other areas. So for the average consumer, um, you know, maybe if you can explain like, uh, you know, Y chromosome, how it, it is going from, uh, you know, father to son to, to other population. And that's why you study that and the mitochondria um, from, from mother to, I mean, it is passing on through the female uh, lineage. So for an average person, how can we explain that in, in simple terms, right? When you're, when you're studying the DNA, of uh, you know of a large population, what? How would you explain that to somebody, let's say in class five or or somebody young uh, who's there? Yeah. Uh, so for the school kids, uh, they of course they may uh, may be studying genetics to some extent, and we have to explain that uh, every individual has uh, forty six chromosomes in every somatic cells. Of that, we inherit 50% out of 46 that exist in 23 pairs. One set, that means 23 chromosomes, come from the mother in the form of egg, and remaining 23 chromosomes come from father in the form of sperm, so the, that fertilized. So whatever uh, the genome we have, that has been equally contributed by both the parents. So, so that's a, a simple thing. Uh, so we inherit all the characteristic features from both the parents. Uh, Sometimes uh, the son or daughter look like, in one particular feature, look like father or mother because that is the dominant uh, feature. Uh, so there's also recessive uh, uh, trait uh, where uh, that is uh, hidden in the individual, but when it goes to the next generation uh, where two chromosomes carry those information is passed, one from the mother, other one from the father, both the copies, then it expresses. That's called as a recessive trait. I can tell there are several examples, even large number of diseases are, uh, some are dominant, some are recessive, and mostly in India, because we follow the endogamy marriage practice, that means marrying within the community, a consanguinity is one where marrying within the family, this is extended consanguinity within the population. 
So there is a recessive mutation, one individual, that means one copy of uh, the chromosome carry the mutation, the other one is normal. The individual will be absolutely fine. Uh, but you consider that father is carrying mutation in one of the chromosome, other chromosome is normal. Similarly, mother is carrying mutation, one chromosome, other chromosome is normal. This is called as heterozygous. One is normal, you can say that this is a right chromosome and this is abnormal. But when it goes to the next generation, uh, this particular event, why Indian populations are uh, prone for large number of recessive disease because the population marry within the community. So if, if one community have some kind of mutation several generation back because they marry within the population, the frequency uh, of that particular mutation is going to increase in the population. Uh, so if when it happens, somebody is marrying within the communities, uh, if the boy and girl carry mutation one chromosome, right? So therefore they are absolutely fine because it's a recessive mutation. When they marry, they can pass on the abnormal chromosome one each to the next generation. When it comes to the next generation in a homozygous condition, I mean both the chromosomes are with abnormality, therefore it causes the disease. So that condition is quite high in India because of the endogamy factors. So that, uh, I think we have to accept that uh, population like uh, existing in India, at least one third of the populations are prone for population specific recessive disease. One so third. Can be one third. So, so because we have high IBD score, identity by descent, that means if you take two unrelated individuals and if you compare their genome in a maybe about 10 KB region and if they are showing identical sequence, that means even today they are not relative, but several generations back they have come from a common ancestor. So that we found in one of the study that at least one third of the populations are prone for such a kind of disease. So, so for a, for an average person, do you recommend that they first check for that before they get married, or would it be just you know from from a probability point of view, if they marry outside the community, there are less chances of of getting. I, I know this is a little bit of a of sensitive topic for people, but you know, I I've married outside of my community, for instance. I've married a you know someone from from Andhra, but uh, and I'm from Rajasthan, but um, and hopefully you know that you know when we looked at the genetics of our kids, I think you know right. it's, it was, yeah. but. But do you think that that's something, you know, when if people can do like a carrier screening or something before, especially in in, in communities that are small and, and are endogamous uh, that are there? Because I think if you look at like the Ashkenazi Jews and, and others, I think now they're mandating some of these tests before uh, before getting married or having a child. Right. right. Uh, you rightly said that in Ashkenazi is Jewish, so it's, it's a practice because they have well studied and they have mapped large number of uh, disease causing mutations so therefore they are in a position to check for those mutations in every single individual because they have uh, you, you must be knowing uh, organization called door Ishra, where they sequence large number of uh, students and they put in their database and since these mutations are known then they, they sequence the individual and uh, look for those mutations. And if the mutations are existing in both boy and girl, then they advise either not to marry or even marry. You have to do the prenatal diagnosis to see whether the fetus is carrying homozygous mutation. That means both the copy of uh, the mutant chromosomes are there. Then they advise accordingly. But uh, we don't have... Uh, that kind of uh, database in every uh, population. So in, in order to do that, we need to have a baseline database. Uh, once we have we identified the mutations which are responsible for some of the disease, of course, we can advise the people to do the testing before doing. But otherwise, we cannot really say 
that even if you identify the mutation, which might be causing disease in some population, particularly in the Western population, it may not cause uh, disease in India. Therefore, uh, blindly we cannot advise everybody to go for uh, checking the mutation. One of the things we are seeing at least is that a lot of times people have a child and then typically they're coming to us when they're planning the second child, right? when there's already a disease. Right. But, you know, maybe in some cases, I think, you know, if we build at least a pan India uh, database, you know, right now we'll be looking at like uh, doing an entire exome sequencing and, and getting that done. But maybe if we can build a cost effective small panel that is that can be done for everybody, I think maybe that that can become a standard way of you know a better return on investment for a larger population. And yeah, we'll, we'll get there soon. That's, that's a good idea, but uh, we have to do it very cautiously because the mutation uh, which causes the disease elsewhere may not I cause know. the disease here. So unless otherwise there is a uh, disease causing mutation in the population where the disease also is running, then it's a good idea to uh, look for those mutation and uh, give them appropriate counsel. And in, in your uh, in your many, many years of research, are, is there something in the Indian population that you have found that is, um, you know, more higher frequency than, let's say, any other population that um, that people maybe should be a little bit careful about or or uh, you, you think that we still need to do a much larger study to be able to ascertain that? Uh, there are several mutations which are uh, specific to India. So, but I want to highlight one particular mutation mm -hmm. that is in the uh, myosin binding protein C3 gene. There's a 25 base per day lesion, uh, which is distributed across India even across South Asia in about 4.5%. Uh, majority of them are heterozygous. If it is a homozygous mutation, then the individual died at very early age. Uh, if it is heterozygous, the individual survive up to 40 or 45 years without any symptoms. Mm -hmm. Then if they are very active as an athlete or cycling, then it will lead to sudden cardiac arrest. So that's one example where I can say that the mutation is restricted to South Asia very high frequency. Uh, similarly, there could be many more. True. We also identified uh, population-specific uh, mutations in large number. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, especially when, like you mentioned, you know, somebody who triggers some of these with their lifestyle, right? I mean, you know, yes. with over exercise or something else. Some of, for some people, it might cause, they might look up healthy on the outside, but there might be something that that is there. So it is, it might be helpful to at least understand that, especially if they know of a family history of some of these diseases running in, in the family. So let me, let me go back to the ancestry part. And I think you have done some really amazing work, uh, you know, especially on the Andamanese population where you said they are like the first uh, set of, um, you know, uh, population that was come from Africa and others. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about some of this fascinating work on 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 Indian ancestry. Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know many of uh, our Indian uh, people knows about Andamanis. So there are four tribal groups in Andaman and Nicobar Islands: uh, Onge, Great Andamanis, Jarvas, and Sentinelis. So they typically look like Africans. The similar features: dark skin color, curly hair, and so on. Uh, but it's amazing, no, because none of uh, the Indian population have the typical features of Andamanis. So we try to understand uh, what is their origin. So we have been working on this particular field for more than two and a half uh, decades. And that's interesting to look at their mitochondrial genome and try to understand what is the genetic link between the Andamanis and Africans. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we found that uh, not much uh, link because their mitochondrial DNA sequence has a lot more mutations compared to the uh, Africans. Okay. Uh, but when we, and, and those mutations are not existing anywhere in the world. It's very, very unique. Then we try to understand how many thousand years of back they diverged from 
Africa. Okay. Based on the mutation rate, we calculated that probably about 65,000 to 70,000 years back, oh. <laughs> they must have reached Andaman and Nicobar Islands. But again, using the earlier uh, hypothesis, northern route or southern route, so we clearly demonstrated that they must have, the first modern human must have migrated out of Africa, taking southern coastal route. Uh, in this process, some groups stayed in southern part of India, some stayed in Andaman Islands, some probably migrated towards Australia, the Australian Aboriginals. Andamanis, some group in uh, South India, particularly in Kerala, still share some kind of genetic affinities that clearly demonstrates that uh, there was a human migration through southern coastal route and uh, gone up to Australia. That's that's quite fascinating. And and what about the North Indians? And you know, I found that, for instance, when we were doing some, you know. I've, I have a lot more Central Asian, a little bit of Europe, because I guess I come from, from Rajasthan. So is there some work on, on that as well, or how that how they came about to India? In yeah, later we studied uh, using this 1 million SNPs from affirmatrics. Again, try to understand uh, you know, Indian population history. Uh, we used very carefully uh, representative uh, populations from all the four major linguistic groups, Dravidians, Indo-European, Austro-Asiatic, and Tibetan Burman. We also used uh, the social groups, so-called upper caste, middle caste, lower caste, tribes, and primitive tribes. Then we found that uh, in India, there were two founding populations, ancestral South Indians and ancestral North Indians, right? The ancestral South Indian probably is part of the early human migration because South Indian populations show some kind of affinities with Andamanis, right? So that tells about ancestral South Indian. The ancestral North Indians, although we don't have defined uh, age, but it was probably much later. Um, there was a migration from Africa towards North. And there was a split. One group has gone to Europe, other group has gone to northern part of India. And another study supporting this because of the spread of language, Indo-European language. So that came uh, from Central Asia to northern part of India. And of course, that has gone to Europe also. Okay. So now it tells that there's a connection between the Europeans, Middle Easterns, and people living in the North uh, through several genetic evidence. So one of the evidence is that Y chromosome haplogroup R1A1 that is uh, that is spread across Europe, mm -hmm. Middle East, and northern part of India. Its frequency is very low in southern part of India. That's one example. Then the mutation which made the skin color turn into lighter skin color, that mutation is again predominant in Europe, Middle East, and northern part of India, but not in South. There's also mutation which helps us in uh, digesting the milk sugar very efficiently, lactate persistent lactate gene. That mutation again common across all the three uh, regions. Europe, Middle East, and Northern part of India. So all it says that there was a migration towards North from Africa, and there was a human divergence some, somewhere in, Middle East, um, uh, in uh, either in Middle East or in Central Asia, which uh, which helps in people migrating towards different directions. It's quite 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 fascinating, right? When you when you look at it, but overall, do you think that you know, humans are still very alike, right? And and a lot of these castes and various other things, I think ultimately DNA sort of <laughs> standardizes everybody in, in, in many ways. So That's there was this uh, movie I had watched, I don't know if you have seen it or not, uh, called Lacho Drome. Uh, I don't know if you have had, had a look at it, but this was a movie, it's a, 
it is doesn't have any like there, there's no dialogue in it but it only goes through like this uh, music and they show that uh, some of these population, the nomadic populations, mm -hmm. on how, uh, but that was sort of like in reverse. So they show that they're starting in Rajasthan and then they're moving towards uh, Middle East and, and uh, Europe and all of that. And mm -hmm. you can actually see the similarities and apparently some genetic similarities as well as these people migrated from one region to another. Uh, but you can see the similarity in song, like in music. Yeah, in fact, I didn't tell you about this because uh, there's no chance of discussing this issue. The European Romas. That's Romas, exactly. Same right. way. Yeah. So in fact, we, we, we did study on them and we have shown that uh, they have migrated from Rajasthan towards Middle East and reached um, Europe. Yes, so that's... genetically, they are similar to some population in Rajasthan. But you must watch that movie because I'm sort of showing that the same. Yeah. Sure, sure, yes. Um, are there anything other, I mean, I'm sure there are thousands of fascinating things, but anything else that you found which was very interesting from a ancestry point of view that, um, you know, research divulged? Um, there are many, uh, many unique populations which we have analyzed. Uh, for example, uh, Siddhis. Mm. Uh, Jewish population, Parsis, and some population in the uh, western part of India, uh, population from uh, uh, Lakshdi. Right? So, so there are a large number of population, population from Himalaya. Right? There are several populations which we have analyzed, at least some uh, 25,000 to 30,000 individuals. Uh, belongs to maybe some 250 uh, to 300 different population groups you have studied. And each one has very uh, unique uh, genotype. Of course, uh, some population we found uh, genotype associated with uh, some unique features. So, so you are, you are uh, found that you also interact a lot with clinicians, right? And and right. you've clearly shown like you start with human genetics, but there's also like a lot of rare diseases and and complex diseases that also sort of go hand in hand. Right. Uh, how do we make it easy for like an average person, uh, not just clinicians but also average people? How do we incorporate some of these thought processes? Because ultimately, I think genomics or genetics becomes like the baseline for not just understanding like we saw that some of the history and geography and everything else gets tied in with something like this right so how do we make sure that you know we can plant these seeds or or these thoughts uh, early on because uh, you know clearly 20 30 years ago you know there was not enough of uh, the genomic information that was there but today there is and even though i see some change when i looked at my daughter's 11th grade uh, biology textbook, I think it's much better than I remember mine. But uh, is there some way that we can make this a process from an education point of view? Can we make it easier for students, but also uh, people who are studying medicine? Because ultimately, I think this is very, ultimately, it's deeply connected with the whole medical field as well. Right? So how do we, how can we make this happen? Yeah, it's very, very uh, important. Uh for people to uh, make them to understand about the genetics, particularly student of uh, medicine. Uh, whenever we find something, whenever we are publishing something related to human health, so we always try to communicate that information to the public through um, either printed media or, or television or so on. So now people understand the impact of uh, the endogamy and sanguinity, uh, and also those who really suffer due to the genetic diseases. If we explain them, they, they understand it's happening because of that, and they are ready to uh, you know, do uh, the subsequent uh, children. They wanted to do prenatal diagnosis, try to understand or the same mutation is existing in the fetus, then accordingly they can take um, whatever the steps they wanted to take it. Uh, so it's good that uh, people are understanding and it's also our uh, 
uh, duty to make them educated in this field. And uh, that's one way of doing it uh, through, uh, through mm -hmm. newspaper, uh, TV, and so on. So other way is that we, uh, we have uh, an important pediatric rare disease program um, recently launched. Uh, so one of the main uh, criteria in this project is to communicate to the common people to, for the importance of uh, doing genetic test if there's a disease running in the family uh, in uh, almost in all local languages because if you, if you communicate through English or Hindi, uh, some of them are not able to understand. So we wanted to make as many regional languages as possible to uh, communicate this through whatever the media, including WhatsApp and so on. Uh, so, so that's very, very important. Plus, whenever I give a talk to uh, in the college or even uh, in the schools, so I always make sure that little bit of the impact of uh, the mutation, uh, impact of mutation in the disease, and how to prevent, we always say that the genetic disease is not curable in some, although there are some gene editing and other aspects are uh, in, in, in the uh, process, but uh, prevention is the best for the genetic disease. When we can prevent, it's, it's good to prevent, right? So, so in that aspect, we are trying to uh, communicate to the public and regarding the medical student, uh, CCMB has a training program mm -hmm. exclusively for the medical student for two weeks or, uh, or one month. They can come and uh, study some kind of genetics, do some experiments. Um, that's another aspect. So I think uh, slowly the genetic is become a common to most of the people, uh, students, medical graduates, and also the common people. So I'm sure in the coming years, um, we'll see the impact of that in terms of preventing such disease in the population. So I, I guess you, know, uh, you talked a lot about the preventing of some of these diseases that are you know, more uh, heritable in you know in that way, but uh, you've also done a lot of work on um, cardiovascular and other where there are many genes that are involved in uh, you know in 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 seeing if the disease is actually going to be caused. Yeah. So for um, in that case, it's not just the genes, but it's a lot of it is what people do with their lifestyles also. Right. Uh, so what have uh, you know? Is there something that we can communicate to people that you know? genes are really not your destiny in many cases. Right? It is more, a, you know, there's still a guide, but a lot depends on what you are doing with that information because ultimately, you know, there's so much more you can do with your lifestyle that changes how, you know, epigenetic factors come in and, and all of that, right? So how do you communicate that to the, you know, so that's one of the things that I'm passionate about and, and I just, you know, would like to see what, what you have to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some of the lifestyle diseases like uh, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, many more. Uh, so they're all lifestyle diseases, and it it has uh, it has increased in greater number uh, in the last two generations. That's again mainly because of uh, the lifestyle, uh, and uh, our genome is adopted for low metabolizing with the limited food available two, three generation back. Uh, because now uh, it's reverse. So genome is adapted to do low metabolizing the whole thing, but uh, the intake is too much. So we are unable, our body is unable to cope up with that. So in, the, uh, in terms of uh, evolutionary perspective, of course, we need to wait for maybe a few generations to have new set of mutations which can effectively metabolize uh, the high fat or high sugar content uh, diet which we take. But until then, 
it's it's very important for us to take care uh better avoid and uh, do exercise which is another major issue those who are living uh, in the cities uh not finding time including me <laughs> right uh, so few generation back and not even generation because uh, my childhood i as i mentioned that um, i born in the the farming family the village so without knowing that we are doing exercise we always do some activities right so that is yeah so that is totally stopped now unless otherwise we have to spend exclusively some time to do some exercise otherwise even today in the village people they they work hard physically so uh, their lifestyle is uh, such that without knowing or without realizing that they are doing exercise they are doing as a part of their activities so that is very very important people to understand that absolutely so i think we we need to get more people to understand that right we have to find ways to incorporate some of these changes in our lifestyle you know and you know i don't know if you follow any specific diet or any any such guidance that you have for the people but i think one of the things i did was to sort of understand both my behavior uh both understand what i eat what are my triggers and uh, also look at my genetic inf information and i right. put all of that pieces together and and sort of you know play till i found something that's sustainable and i think that's what i tell people that you know one diet or the other you know people go crazy about a specific diet but everybody is different and everybody behaves differently so they need to understand that so yes. is there anything else that you would like to talk about or i will move to the rapid fire round of my <laughs> Yes. Anything you want to ask? Then I will I'll talk about. Uh... Yeah, I, I mean, there's obviously many things. I I know that it's almost we are we are close to get to about an hour, so I don't want to uh, ask too many more questions. But if there's something that I you would like, you know, that you are currently working on, something that's fascinating, that uh, or or something that you know, some advice that you would like to give our our viewers, then that that would be great. Then we'll move on to the. Uh, yes, for uh, research work, as I mentioned, one of the new activities in CDFD which we have taken is uh, looking at the pediatric rare disease genetic aspects uh, so that we can help the community not having a uh, disease burden, right? That's uh, one aspect. Um, the other aspect is that uh, uh, the ancient DNA work which uh, now probably people understood much uh, after uh, Savante Pago got Nobel Prize for his work, um, you know, looking at uh, the Neanderthals and so on. Uh, so that's another work which we do, but very limited way, uh, mainly because we don't have uh, the well-preserved uh, ancient samples. but. We work on very limited way. So we also uh, recently identified several genes which are responsible for male infertility about a few couple of months back. Uh, I still continue on all these aspects. There are some uh, new findings which are under consideration in terms of tracing ancestry, some work on uh, mitochondrial disorders and we have several collaborations. Uh, that's one aspect. The second aspect, uh, as far as the advice is concerned, maybe there's no advice, just a suggestion for the students. There's a lot more uh, to work on uh, genetic aspects, a uh, lot of potential uh, in, in this particular field particularly medical graduates, so they can understand both the human aspects. And once they understand the human aspects, and if they understand the genetics, and they are the best people to uh, treat or advise to the community. Uh, so, and uh, also for the common people, they should also understand about uh, the marriage pattern, marriage practice, that the endogamy is the one which actually causes more disease, population-specific diseases, and try to avoid wherever there's a 
close relative marriage, either consanguinity or endogamy. So, so consanguinity is when they marry within their family, like, you know, in some communities we've seen they marry their own uncles as well. Correct. In some, it is the uh, it is on the mother's side, some it is on the father's side. But yes. in both cases, I think it is it is probably not the best thing to do yes. from a, uh, you know from a genetic point of view. Yes. Because, you know, I think initially I don't know why they were designed. Maybe it was to preserve wealth. But I think you know if health is wealth, then you want to preserve health first, right? So, right, right. Yeah. I'll probably even if we go back several uh, hundreds of generation back. Probably those days, people live as a group group in a small uh, place. Uh, so it happened much before the caste system came into existence. So because there's no uh, possibility for somebody from one particular region, maybe you can say in Meet the jungle, someone else. So, yeah. yes, in the jungle, to go to other place migration is a problem and where to find is a problem. Therefore, they started marrying within that group. So that started continuing. Of course, now things have changed and we are also have to need to change that practice. One, one, one more question that just popped in my mind. Um, you know, clearly I think COVID brought about a lot of, um, you know, awareness about genetics and people all suddenly know RNA, DNA and all that. Uh, do you think it has greatly influence the way people look at um, you know science and and uh, you think that that will that has been good from a for the scientific community or do you think that that was just a blip in the this thing and then it goes back into things being normal uh, no no i don't think it will go back because uh, now it, covid of course start many things this is one of the things which uh, people understood about uh, what science can do and how science is helping in many ways, uh, including, uh, of course, that's a different aspects altogether uh, about vaccine and so on. But at least they would understand the value of uh, the science and how science helps the community. So, so I don't think people will forget about it, but it will increase. <laughs> no, I, I think so not, too. Not only that, because there are other aspects where people also understood and being practiced uh, about looking at the genotype and accordingly treat the patients, particularly uh, some of the cancers, cardiovascular disease. So they've all been treated based on the genotype, particularly the gene which metabolizes the drug. If that has a set of mutation, it would give therapeutic response. If the mutate if that mutation is not there, the set of different mutation, there's no effect at all. But the other set of mutation might lead to adverse effect. Yes. Right? That's rather than treating somebody and you are actually uh, killing the person. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So so people are aware of genetics and science. That brings me to one more topic. And first is uh, because you do research in so many different areas. Uh, you've also written a lot of papers on Ayurveda as well, uh, where you're trying to connect the dots over there. Uh, so do you think that we can do a more systematic study in the future uh, on in you know using our ancient methods of you know Ayurveda being a holistic health uh, to you know genomics, which is also in some ways hopefully in you know holistic health in my opinion. Uh, so do you think that is something that we are headed towards or we need a lot more to be done in that space? Yeah, yeah. Ayurveda, in fact, if you look at uh, that's kind of science which is amazing to see now. Because now we talk about genetics, we talk about pharmacogenomics and so on. And uh, 5,000 years back, without any modern tools, how much the Ayurvedic practitioners, as well as uh, Vaidyas, must have used to understand what type of medicine should be given to what kind of people, right? Based on the prakriti type, vata, pitta, kapha, or mixture of all the uh, two or three different kind of uh, thing. That's also we can call it as that's an ancient form of genomics, <laughs> right? 
And in fact, uh, we did a study using genomic approach and we did find that uh, uh, Vata, Pitta and Kapha, each one, has been defined by a different set of uh, mutations, right? So that has genetic basis that the, the, the classification of Vata, Pitta, Kapha, mm -hmm. in fact, as the genetic basis or scientific basis. So that we have proved and uh, now there are a lot more uh, studies um, which actually again using the genotype and see which kind of Ayurvedic medicine gives therapeutic uh, response. So there are many things that are happening. Hopefully that uh, people use it more effectively than before. I, I agree. I mean, I, I went to the Ayurveda uh, hospital about, I think, a year and a half ago uh, when I had a back problem. And I think some of the, you know, it was quite fascinating for me to see uh, because ultimately, like you said, you know, in, in many ways, they were looking at it from a phenotype perspective and, and yes. they're still able to find that correlation between uh, what, what you'll find from a genetic study versus that. Right? So I think it's fascinating. And I think hopefully the field will evolve to sort of put all these pieces of information together into something much more meaningful. Thanks. So let me move on to the, the rapid rapid fire. Um, we, you discussed lots of different aspects. Uh, uh, which one is your favorite? Ayurveda, car cardiovascular, ancestry, or any other? Yeah, the, my favorite is ancestry because other uh, studies um, can tell about uh, to some extent because this is a curiosity uh, for everybody, right? try to understand the whole population history because that's really fascinating. So that's our, uh, this thing, it says curiosity is in my DNA. <laughs> so I guess you need to make sure you have one of those as well. Uh, not only that, because that allows me to go to Andaman and Nicobar Islands, collecting sample from the tribe, go to various tribal population area in Chhattisgarh and many more places. So. Not only that is restricted to the laboratory, it allows me to go to different oh, places, yes. very remote places. And it's very, very uh, interesting. You mean, then your favorite vacation spot is Andaman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say. <laughs> All right. Which is your favorite book or a movie that you can tell us about? Uh, book? Actually, there are very few. Uh, in fact, I studied um, other than the, the, the subject books. So another book is uh, written by my own collaborator, David Reach. So mm -hmm. are we, or how do we come from, uh, where do you come from? Come from yes. Yeah, so that's that's one. And a similar line, there's one written by uh, Tony Joseph about early mm -hmm. Indians, of course. There are a few in that line, um, only the Sapiens, uh, written by Noha Harari, yeah. something like that, not many. Similar similar uh, book interest, I guess. In, yeah. So okay, the next next question is, um, you know, uh, who, which scientist inspired you the most? I'm sure there were many, but uh, is there any particular person that yeah, there can be many. living or dead? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are many scientists, but uh, somebody with whom I work very closely, right? So they are uh, they are really inspired me. Mm. Within the close affinity is Dr. Lalji Singh. Um, yes, not only for science and also this administrative capacity and uh, how he thinks that uh, the way he develops the institutes and so on. That's the really and other my collaborators like David Reach, I was saying, and uh, uh, there are quite a few. <laughs> and, and your worst subject in school? Yeah, my worst subject in school is history because very difficult to remember the name and the year. <laughs> so now you are discover, rediscovering history, right? I mean, in many ways. So. Yeah, of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. okay. So when are you writing your book? <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, uh, <laughs> that came into my thought several years ago, and the similar question has been asked by many people. 
but right now difficult to uh, find time but of course uh, maybe after a few years i might start <laughs> i realize it's not an easy thing to so i i mean i write sometimes when i feel like it and i proposed a book 7 years ago and mm -hmm. i still haven't finished it so you know i think it yes. does takes take time it takes a lot of time uh, but yeah so unless I, otherwise we uh, we take off from what are they doing is, it's very difficult to uh, write a book but i think you know your experiences and your uh, research i think will be very inspirational if you if you can you know find the time to write a book so. yeah definitely i'll do it but not immediately not, not immediately all right so with that i think uh, i don't have any any more questions for for now but hopefully you know at, so, at some other time we'll meet you in person and and again and uh, hopefully you know a longer conversation at some other time so thank you very much it was uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and thank you thank you so much for having all this question and asking me <laughs> of course that would be useful for uh, the common people and uh, yeah thank you so much for this initiative thank you thank you very much